Welcome to the Korea Society's first live webcast of 2021. I'm Jayo, Senior Director of Arts and Culture, and Happy New Year to you all, wishing you all the best for 2021. The Magical Language of Others is a powerful and aching memoir, a story of love and forgiveness in letters written by letters written in Korean by a mother and the translation of those letters by her daughter. E.J. Ko is a poet whose collection of poetry is titled A Lesser Love, a PhD candidate at the University of Washington in Seattle and the author of And the Daughter in Magical Language of Others, which was just awarded Pacific Northwest Book Award and long listed for the Penn Open Book Award. EJ is joining us live from Seattle. We have a <laughs> slight technical difficulties because of the um, power outage in Seattle. So she's just calling in, but welcome to the Korea Society, EJ. Thank you so much for joining us, especially on a crazy day like today. <laughs> Thank you, Jay, for creating such a wonderful space and for accepting me as I am as audio and to everyone working behind the scenes. And I know Peter had to do some work uh, last minute, but thank you for making this possible and being so flexible. Great. A quick reminder to our viewers, you can send your questions to EJ via Twitter at Korea Society Art or email arts and culture at koreasociety.org. So EJ, the magical language of others opens with your note on translation. And I thought maybe we can start with you reading a little excerpt from it. Mm -hmm. I, would, I would love to, I, I can read the first paragraph of the note on translation and the last two. A note on translation. My mother opens her letters in Korean, Annyeong. This translates into hi or hello. I use both for the Korean greeting. Hi beams outward like the sun's rays. The tone transports energy without expecting reciprocity. One may absorb high with a casual wave or respond with a smile. Hello, boomerangs for a response. Over the phone, one says hello to hear a voice calling through silence. Hello is an alteration of holo or holo from old high German hala or hola, used to hail a ferryman. Hello comes as a question. Are you there? Hello fetches me across an expanse of water. To my limits, I do not see my translations as complete. If her letters could go to sleep, my translations would be their dream. The letters transport my mother to wherever I reside so they may, in her place, become a constant dispensation of love. Forty-nine letters were discovered after an unknowable number had been trashed or forgotten. In Buddhist tradition, forty-nine is the number of days a soul wanders the earth for answers before the afterlife. Thank you so much. Um, you. I think your Thank note you. on translation really captures what follows um, in the rest of, rest of the book. And I hope our viewers got a sense of it, um, especially from you reading it. Um, for those who have not read your book yet, um, by the way, the paperback version of The Magical Language of Others is coming out next week. Can you tell us why you received those letters from your mother? Why she's starting to write to you? Yes, I'm happy to. When I was 14, my father got a lucrative job offer in South Korea. 
And the next year, my father accepted that offer. And so both my mother and father moved to South Korea. And they left me behind with my brother, who was four years older than me. So he had just turned 19. And they moved us about uh, across, across the state to Davis, California, and put us in a little house there. Initially, the first contract was supposed to be about three years. And uh, however, that became five years then seven years, and it was nine years before I reunited with my family again in Seattle, Washington. Now, during my teenage years, I, I, quickly, uh, I quickly attached myself to uh, a lot of harmful ways I can harm myself, and so I began drinking and quickly became an alcoholic uh, at a young age and did drugs. And I attempted my life regularly because I thought, why not? During the years of our separation, my mother wrote me letters every week in Korean. And I would try to read them and I understood them at a very surface level um, but not so well and I would either throw them away or put them out of sight and so nine years later when I was moving to Seattle I found in a box 49 of my mother's letters and I began to translate them with the encouragement of Domini Che, who's also a poet and translator here in Seattle. Because at the time, I, I had already become a poet and translator, and I just couldn't see what I was supposed to do with these letters. And it took another voice out of kindness and out of such wisdom to say, maybe I have to read these letters again. And that was the beginning of this memoir. And reading your mother's letter and your translation of them, I think there's no question that your mother had this intense love for you. And the fact that you're a daughter, not a son, is very important to her, um, that she had a da- daughter like, she has a daughter <laughs> like you. And there is a line in your book that says, um, I'm quoting, while you can fight with your daughter, you must bite your tongue in front of your son. Um, can you tell us how you perceived, and probably that stood out to me because I only have two boys, I don't have a daughter. Um, can you tell us how you perceived this notion of this very special bond between mother and daughter um, that your mom seems to have? And was it always there or did she express it more after she left and wrote to you? Mm. Thank you for that question. I think it's wonderful you have sons, by the way. <laughs> and I, I, I don't feel like um, there's any loss in having um, sons or daughters. So that's a really precious relationship. Um, But I can speak to, I was raised by the Korean Catholic communities in the Bay Area. And I would go to the masses and go to sort of the monthly meetings or go to the uh, hangul market. And what I would do as a child, um, I would just listen. (laughs) I would sit around and I would get these glimpses into the the really interesting talks and the chatter. And I was surrounded by um, my grandmother raised me most of the time when I was younger. And so I was surrounded by a lot of loving harmonies. And 
ajumas who, who, who took me from one place to another and allowed me to hear the language they were speaking and the way they talked about their lives. And so this phrase, um, oh, it, it's almost... It, it's almost like I could hear it now in a very specific voice. And I hear it um, said across the room in a loud place and everyone trying to cook dinner for 18 families <laughs> and everyone setting the table. And I hear this little quip, you know, you have to bite your tongue in front of your son. And I think later on in the book, it even adds to how our wrinkles appear on her face as a reflection of who we're biting our tongue and, and, and who when we're not biting our tongue and how that affects how we age. And those are really uh, tiny moments that I, I recall and I wanted to capture and, and put into the memoir. It, it, it filled my memories to hear them and it gave me so much to wonder about. And it made me ask about what what is our relationship like that? Do you feel that way with me? Is there something here that I, I don't quite understand? And how, you know, I think at the core of that question for me is how can I get closer to you without feeling like you have to be one way or another? Mm -hmm. How can you accept me and how can I accept you um, just as we are? Mm. And it means we have to go through lots of um, cultural memory and lots of cultural impressions that came out of history, the history within families. And so those are some of my, my wonderings. Mm. I was just wondering, did she write to your brother because you had an older brother too and mm -hmm. he was living with you when they went to Korea was she writing to her to him as well do you know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, this question came up only one other time and it was almost exactly a year ago at my book launch for the mm. memoir and somebody asked and my brother happened to be sitting in the crowd mm. and right in front of me in the front row and I sort of looked at him mm. and almost gestured do you want to answer <laughs> maybe and I remember him he, he's such a confident person, you know, and mm. he's really outspoken and he's very, uh, he's just such a, uh, so good with people and maybe a bit more extroverted than I am. I'm, I can be such an introvert. And he shouted out into the crowd, mm. no, <laughs> she just gave me responsibility. <laughs> you know, meaning that he felt like she just left in me mm. a, a, a teenage girl to look after. And I think yeah. there were lots of reactions to this because on one hand, it, it's, it's, he had to wake up every morning by seven to take me to school. And I wasn't, I was certainly not going to school and waiting for him to pick me up. He he was trying to keep a family together that consisted of two teenage teenagers. So yeah. there was a lot um, for him. And I think a lot still here um, that maybe yeah. I can't speak to as well for him to, to understand about those years. Yeah. And speaking of your mother's letters, um, you translate your mother's letter, and we have a lot of questions about that act of translation, which I would like to get to a little later. But you don't talk about them, per se, by which I mean you don't analyze the letters, per se, in, your, in the book. Um, mm -hmm. Out of the 49 letters you found, 
Um, I think there are about nine letters that I included in your in the book. Um, was there a particular reason you chose those nine letters or um, why did you decide to include them in the book the way you did? I mean, obviously the act of translation is you trying to interpret your mother's letter to you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, my first intention was to just translate the 49 letters and what followed was the context of those letters. And that's what turned it into a memoir because I began adding to the letters, adding um, chapters. But to me, they felt almost like stanzas in poetry of what was going on in and between these, the, the, the times that I'm getting these letters. It, it felt um, the letters started to become points of contrast for me. How can a letter with so much love and so much grace come to a person at, at the time in which her only vision of her life is, a, is one in which she takes her own life? The, the, the intense contrast of the letters and my internal life as a, as a girl dealing with our separation is really what um, came out of uh, the initial 49 letters. And then the, uh, many of the letters started to fall away um, out of um, finding the, the nine or 10 letters that became the anchor points that were um, pivotal points in my life, but also held many of um, what the other letters said. Uh, there's quite a bit of redundancy and repetition in a great way that comes out in the memoir. Um, but with all 49, there was, there was quite a bit of that and it gave a very different effect. And so I wanted to come down to the nine or 10 that really, uh, uh, that can be anchors for us and get a, a, a good sense of her life in Korea and what that's like. And so what is beautiful about your memoir is that as honest and revealing as your writing is, um, there are also a lot of things left unsaid as well. Um, it, 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 just like your mother's letter gives us glimpse of her life in Korea, like we get glimpses of your, your life in the United States. Um, and I wanted to ask you about this act of writing a memoir. Um, and I ask you this because actually in, from my own understanding of Korean literature in Korea, um, there isn't that much of memoirs per se. Um, <laughs> a lot of, especially when it comes to a very personal, um, uh, especially when it's regarding to your family history. Um, it's almost <laughs> like sort of a revealing secrets and you don't want to tell other <laughs> families all the secrets of your own family. Um, I was just wondering, and I'm sure you've gotten this questions before, what was your mother's reaction to your, you writing a memoir? And it's, it's, it seems pretty clear to me in the book while you're reading it that she was very much aware of what you would write and she would mm -hmm. not have any, any illusions <laughs> about you um, not telling, you know, the sort of what you went through. Um, so what was her reaction? Hmm. Is that a difficult I remember, question? Yeah. No, it's, it's a good breathing sigh. It's a wonderful question. I remember one of the readings I had, it was one of my last readings for my tour last year, and it was right before the lockdown. And it was a smaller reading. So my mom, my mom came and she, dressed up and she was shining. She was effervescent. 
she was uh, she is such a ham <laughs> so uh, glittery and loves chatting people at the door helping them in their seats you know a really really engaging and it was just a treat to see her be uh, a star because I, I know that she is and it was no surprise to me that at the end of the reading uh, there was a line for book signing which is a pretty normal uh, for reading but the line to meet my mother was even longer <laughs> it was out the door <laughs> everyone wanted to take a picture with her, um, talk to her, uh, this, uh, this group, uh, this reading group, they came, they wanted to hold her hand. And it was remarkable to see. And I think the personality we get of her from the chapters and from the letters, it's in person, it's even more so, it's even more vivid. And I know that she's been I think she she's been really enjoying enjoying the, the everything, no longer being just our secret, but a secret that belongs to the community and to all of us. Because the reception so far has been so um, embracing and understanding of of my mother's choices and her life. Because you know, you read the summary and you really think how could somebody do this? But the memoir itself isn't narrated that way. It's not structured that way. It's structured in a way to understand this person. You have to understand them as a daughter. Uh, you have to understand their mother and you have to understand their mother as a daughter and, 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 and their mother. So it's, it's I think, Today, when I speak to my mom on the phone, she she's she feels lighter, and and the way she talks about what was, what could have been, or what was supposed to be has sort of shifted into that was that, and if anything, she has been more of a mother to me now than I ever used to and I thought she was before and, and in a way that's a little sad <laughs> because you and for me I think oh there she, she's she's being so motherly and, and yet I miss every part of her and I want her to know that every part of her is what I accepted not just not just the hope of her being somebody else that's beautiful um, and I do want to talk a little bit about this people's reaction to your story. As you said, um, a lot of people tend to focus on that issue of abandonment and especially reading what you went through because of um, you feeling like you were left alone, um, even though your brother was there. Um, and there's a part in the book, later in the book, um, about the reading in New Hampshire and what happened after afterwards with one of the uh, <laughs> audience member and how he was wondering how they could have done it this year. I'm sure you probably got a lot of reactions from the readers um, sort of, and there seems to be this emphasis on how a family should behave, what a family unit should be. And especially when it comes to mother because a lot of people would say things like well why couldn't your father just go by himself right um <laughs> so did all these reactions surprise you or have you ever felt like did it sort of you know trigger is kind of the buzzword these days did it ever trigger sort of mm -hmm. that sense of abandonment again for you or did it mm -hmm. or did it make you really feel like you've moved on from that perspective what was that react mm -hmm. what what have you been your um experience like just listening to other people's reaction to a, you know when they first hear the premises of the book 
Mm-hmm. Well, thank, thank you for that question. I don't think I've been asked that before. And so I'm really excited about this conversation and this space. So thank you, Jay, this is wonderful. Um, I, if I were to say just in a very vague way, I was, I was quite prepared. And I think I was prepared looking back because I was surrounded by the support of so many of my teachers and my students. I had gone in and out of workshops. I had crossed and moved across the country a couple times at that point. And and I, I it wasn't that I developed a thick skin. I think it's a little different from that. I think it's that I was able to widen the space of my heart to hold as many disparate things at once and simultaneously. The, the idea that, because thick skin almost alludes to the idea that I'm going to lock this out. And that can come back later and become a very, uh, uh, have its own reckoning. <laughs> Whereas, working toward writing and trying to um, having having the work of a poet translator writer that that work it, a lot of it has to do with just widening this widening the space of your heart and the ability to hold opposing ideas and so I never take anything off the table so when I meet somebody and they say you were completely abandoned. I don't say that I was not abandoned. I think that deserves to stay on the table, but I'm also allowed to add things to that table. And another thing I would add is that um, my mother's idea of a family, my parents' ideas of a family, and my expectations of a family were different. And it was those expectations that caused more pain than the actual separation itself. I think that's why when we get to the end and I'm thinking back and I'm trying to let my mother go, even though we've been apart, I've never let her go. And that's what was painful is that I always felt she couldn't and she doesn't get to do that. When I see her with compassion or magnanimity, it seems very much something that can be added to the table is what it means for her to uh, support her family across the ocean, how that's important for her, how um, it's important for her to reunite with her own family. And that there are histories here that I don't, don't quite know or understand, but I can try. And you certainly do. And in the in your book, you include the stories of your grandmothers. As you said, you try to understand your mother as a daughter as well, not just as your mother. And the story of your both of your grandmothers is just extraordinary. Um, <laughs> or I guess I should say it's extraordinary. And also it's a very a Korean story as well. Um, I do want to start with your maternal grandmother, whom you never met because she passed away mm -hmm. when she was very little, which uh, when, she, when actually your mother was very young, um, when she was a young mm -hmm. woman. Um, so you did not know her. Um, how, what was the image of her when you were little? Did you hear about her from your mother? And how mm -hmm. did you... Uh, construct this beautiful portrait of her in your book. Um, was there a lot of research that you had to do? And by research, I mean talking to people who knew her, that would be your mom and her siblings, right? Um, how did you come mm -hmm. to this, this portrait of your grandmother? Hmm. I remember my mother, since I 
to go as far back as I can remember, I hear my mother telling me the story of June and Lee, her parents. And because my mother had lost her own parents, both tragically, um, very close together, and when she was young, which is also a kind of separation, it, it was almost like through the years she would talk about this exact story, almost beginning to, to end, um, moment by moment. And I had it imprinted into my mind, my body, because I knew it was something that traumatized her and that trauma was something she played over and over again. It was something she maintained and it became a bedtime story. It became a song. It mm. became uh, something I was familiar with even as uh, when I went into my teens and into adult. It, it was almost the first story for me. And, uh, uh, other kids had wonderful bedtime stories about Cinderella and um, other wonderful fairy tales, I, which I love. But in in my home, it it seemed very much like every night it, it was a story. It was this story or similar ones like it, and it was that's why you love people because you don't know when they're gonna die. Good night. <laughs> it was it, it was wow. always a a warning or um but something i i took too hard it, it, mm. it's so it, it's so much pain that um, she carries and i didn't want her to carry it alone and so when i went about writing the story with june and lee i had the oral history i had to um sort of um try and go back to find records many records are not there by the way, which I think is the case for uh, a lot of Korean and Korean American families, in which case looking for um, as best you can living survivors or uh, living family members. And if, if they're not um, really going into the history and what's helpful, I think, is if you can, if you can cross history through language I think there are different stories told in the English than there are in the Korean. And, and any one of these access points can, can be a way to, to, to understand and enter the story and find not just the facts and not the, I remember once I was getting obsessed with the size of the bus that my mother might be taking when she was a girl, but really getting down to the essential truth, which was how, what does it feel like? What does it feel like to try and persuade your mother to, to save herself, to keep her life, to stick around? Um, how do yeah. I express that? How, so, so it's been that sort of work. Mm. That makes sense. And then there's your paternal grandmother, um, whom you knew very well because she immigrated to the United States with your family. And she, as you mm -hmm. mentioned earlier, she raised you um, when you were little and you are very, it sounds like she, you were very close to her, but then you knew her as a grandmother and then you find out about what her life was like as a young girl, um, which leads you to and I don't want to go get into too much details because I want the readers to read it and find out oh, themselves, yeah. <laughs> um, which leads you to all the different places. Um, but there is this sense of so much, uh, so much trauma. I mean, I know like we use the word so lightly almost these days, but there is real sense of historical trauma in your paternal grandmother's life and your maternal mm -hmm. grandmother's life and I was just wondering how do you think it passed down onto your parents and then to you because actually you do mention mm -hmm. that you know in the book you says I am an 
an accumulation of their lives. Um, how did it affect your parents, do you think? And did that help you understand I guess, sort of understand the choices they made. Mm. I hope it's not too hard of a question. <laughs> no, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful, thoughtful question, and I want to give it the thoughtful answer. I, I just, you know, I want to say this uh, because I give such long answers, I can really get away with, with my no. thoughts. But I, I remember when being raised by my grandmother, my my parents had just immigrated and so they were busy working um, night shifts, double shifts. And I remember my grandmother most, my father's mother, and she had the most incredible, uh, generous uh, spirit. <laughs> and it almost seemed inhuman to me. It, mm. I remember even as a child thinking, that's her superpower. Mm -hmm. We all have incredible powers, but I, I, I saw her and I said, this is hers. She can give um, with no end. And it, it truly seemed um, without limit. And so when I learned um, through the stories of my father and and you're being so considerate and kind. Here I am giving spoilers and you're being careful about the spoilers, but I it it, it almost made more sense to me mm -hmm. to understand the life she had lived across Korea and Japan and then coming to the US. Um in her life in Jeju Island and and all the, the things in between those terrifying and difficult years. It, it's not that, it wasn't a question of, oh, how could you do this? Now it made even more sense that the, the amount of the extent to which she endured such suffering was, the, was equal to the extent to which she can give love. Mm. It, and it, it, it was... It was an incredible thing. And so when I write about her story, I, I did have to ask uh, around quite a bit because not giving too much away, but the historical records are uh, mostly uh, just burned down and we don't have living survivors. And right. um, it, it means there's a lot of oral history, but I had the help of, I think librarians are just um, wonderful, wonderful <laughs> human beings. Uh, I worked with the Korea Studies specific librarian here in Seattle at the University of Washington and, and other librarians who were able to lead me to texts that I might find about a, a certain time period or event and trying to locate where my grandmother would be. I, I can't tell where she would be on a certain date, but I can get a sense of where she might be during a certain year around these months. And, and things like the tracing, assembling, uh, letting myself be led, it was very helpful in, in understanding the trauma that was passed down and that gets repeated through each generation. And saying, okay, we're all uh, women who are separated from our mothers through these circumstances and it's happening again and again. And what can, what can my knowledge of that, how can it affect my present? Can I do something differently today that would affect my past and also affect the future? 
So I think those were questions I had in building the structure of the memoir. Mm. So I wanted to ask you about the act of translation. Um, you obviously learn Korean. You said you grew up with it, but you said you weren't so comfortable with it. And then you later, when you grew up, you actually studied the language. And then you also studied Japanese. Um, I don't know how good your Japanese about are, but it sounds like you had at least some, you know, really strong grasp of the language. Um, do you think you're a different person when you speak or write in different languages? Like, do you think different side of comes you out when you um, use specific language or is it just, um, are you adapting to sort of what the language requires? Um, I, I, I hope that's not too uh, nebulous mm -hmm. of a question. Um, what do you think comes out more, say, when you're speaking or writing in Korean versus in English? Mm. Mm. Or do you think there is any difference? I mean, do you really think it's mm. the same? How you express is the same? Mm -hmm. I you know many authors who write in other languages has mentioned this, but it's almost as if when you, when they, they've talked about writing in another language in order to get more out that hasn't been able to come out in one language. It's uh. almost as if the limitations of writing in a second or third language can be really uh, enlightening. It can be creatively inspiring because when you're not writing in the language in which you have this uh, sort of intuitive gut command over, uh, it's going to allow more processes to come through. Like you're, you, you might not even notice that you're self-editing, you're mm -hmm. choosing words. It's not, um, it's not exactly on the page as it would have appeared in your mind. So when you write in a second language, um, it, it, what it can do is force you to use the simplest words to try and convey the most complex emotions. And that limitation of your vocabulary and of your thought, because I, I think it helps to also think in the second and third language if, or with the purpose of writing. It, it's going to create new um, connections between words, between experiences. It's going to sort of put your memories in a different perspective. And you lean, I mean, you have nothing to lean on. And so your, your desire to lean is going to be very obvious, right? If you're, you, you depend on certain devices or tools you have as a writer, well, mm -hmm. in, a, in a second or third mm -hmm. language, you do not have those at right. your disposal. Mm -hmm. you, you, can't, you can't get away with, with just, let's say, beautiful language or, I, I, you know, I love poetry. You know, you, you're not going to be able to do that. And so in some ways that that can be very, um, it can be a wonderful writing exercise. By the way, mm. if there aren't are any students listening in, um, I know that what's interesting is I, I, I find myself thinking in different languages based on situations. And that really interests me because it cues me that there is something in one language that is untranslatable in mm. another language. And so I find myself going back to that language to get mm. a, a very specific sense of a word. And that's a, um, I, su I suppose it's something I, I really took on and I became interested in because it, it, it gave me ideas to say, what is this untranslatable feeling or moment and how can I convey that in English or how can I um, explain what that is in Korean now um, I think that's that can be really exciting mm. 
Yes. And we got so many questions from our viewers about this act of translation. So I wanted to ask you a couple of questions regarding that. Um, and I think you kind of answered, somebody was just asking, what would be your advice for aspiring translators? Um, those who are, I think that um, mm. person was specifically asking about translating from Korean to English, but I guess it can apply mm -hmm. to vice versa or any other language. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. I think, and I, I've talked about this before, mm. but when I first started out translating, I was taught in a traditional way of translation. So it means we're translating for a seamless translation, one in which the text reads like it was written originally in the language it's being translated into. And there's a lot of benefit and advantages to that. So I understand the rigor, but after leaving that, um, that education, uh, talking and meeting to Korean women poets and translators, uh, the circle, circles of, of wonderful poets like Don Miche, who I already mentioned, um, opened my eyes to what a translator is doing politically when they translate from one language to another. And it wasn't until I was able to join those conversations, attend the panels, seek out relationships and, and, and really create a, a, just a community around me to get a sense that, oh, there are dominant and non-dominant languages because those languages have history. So as a translator, when I translate something from Korean to English, what am I doing? Is it erasure? So if I don't want that, how much do I want the Korean to come forward? How much am I willing to bend some of the rules so that you can read it in English, but the Korean is still present? So those were some of the questions that really excited me and forced my, my mind to think in different ways. And I think as a translator, that, that flexibility, that openness, the readiness, and also the community is going to be uh, so helpful. Mm. And your next project actually coming up, I think, I believe this summer is the English translation of a contemporary Korean poetry by E1, correct? Um, which mm -hmm. we are all very much looking forward to. And then there were questions about this sort of translating in order to preserve memories. A lot of people, by the way, today happens to be um, Korean American Day, January 13th. Is so <laughs> happy Korean American Day to everybody who's watching. But um, <laughs> the questions were, when you have that language barrier, um, even within two generations, um, which a lot of immigrant families do, and also, I guess, the cultural barrier, what would you recommend to people who want to preserve those stories but lack the language to do so, um, other than study Korean, I guess? But what, how would anybody sort of approach these stories? Because a lot of other people also mentioned how you seem to lack the anger that you, a lot of people people find in immig immigrant um, literature. There seems to be, you <laughs> seem to, um, so I guess that's what a lot of people are wondering too. How do you approach those stories when there seems to be so many barriers? Mm. Uh, I, I'm going to try to answer both parts of this question having to do with um, translating anger and or writing anger in memoir and the barriers mm. of uh, preserving memories. And the first part, I would say, I had written a draft of the magical language of others, many <laughs> drafts, and they were filled with rage. 
filled with anger, if you can imagine it. No, um, I can't. <laughs> that's that's tears. a surprise. Yeah. Hot, hot tears running down my face in a cabin in New Hampshire, locked myself in and saying, I don't understand. And one of the most moving things that I learned, it was, it was the first lesson I had in poetry. And it was what my poetry teacher taught me. Uh, they said, wow, you know, EJ, you can write a lot of poems. And you know how to begin poem. And you know how to fill up the poem. But you need to learn how to end a poem. Basically, I lacked magnanimity to end a poem. Yeah. If you don't have magnanimity for the turn, which is tends to be the last line or the last few lines of the poem, then it's not a poem. It's it's a diary entry. It's a journal. It's a, it's a young girl sort of venting. But what makes a poem a poem is that in it. You have to forgive your mother by the end of the poem, or the poem has to forgive you for not being able to. For me, the memoir was a work of discovery. The revision wasn't just revising a manuscript. For me, it was revising me. It was about how, how can I change in order to change what was being written before me and the amount of discovery and transformation I had to go through to be able to say um, the things I did, I think, is, is what makes the memoir uh, a memoir. Um, otherwise, you know, I think it would be fairly boring. And I can tell you with uh, confidence that the earlier drafts were very boring <laughs> because they were just angry <laughs> from beginning mm. to end. And even I didn't want to read it. Mm. So... It's, it was a lot of work, and I think uh, it's a work that I have a lot of reverence for. Mm. Um, in, in, tra in translating and also preserving memories that, you know, I know the, the person who asked framed it in silence, but there's, I, I think there's two other things, right? It's, it's silence, mm. it's judgment, and it's shame. And those are the places that tend to be, you know, as, as a sort of, they tend to have such scorching heat. They tend to have incredible sparks. And those are the places that usually signal that this is where to begin. This is where to start. Look here. Listen here. How does it manifest in other ways? Because silence isn't just silence. Uh, you you got to see for gestures, uh, for tone, for, for the day, what, what other things are happening. And I would just um, also encourage that there seems to be, uh, with, with a, a good reason, an assumption that we have to have all the tools, we have to know everything, we have to be perfect in these languages and be historians and whatnot, but uh, this is a great reminder for me that the most important thing is, is not all that because you'll learn what you need to along the way. The most important thing is to just start. That is the most important thing. And, and once you start, it, it, the rest will come. It's beautiful. But you found um, poetry when you were in college, I believe. And the sec this section in the book of how you found poetry is really beautiful too. But there was one teacher and you seem to have a great love with finding these wonderful teachers. Um, but one of them <laughs> told you um, that if you want to be a good poet, then write poetry. If you want to be a great poet, then translate. And what did, what do you think he meant? And I, I think I get a sense when you were just 
talking, I think I got a little bit of sense of what that really meant. But, and, you know, I'm sure it, you can write a book about what that means. But just uh, mm -hmm. shortly, what do you think he meant by that? I, I love that line. And the person who said it was, um, Eamon Grennan, he's a poet, uh, Irish poet from, I, I met him at Columbia University where he was uh, teaching a workshop and asking us to translate. And I just remember sitting in that workshop when he said that and it felt like he was saying that to me. Uh, for one reason or another, as soon as I got out, mm -hmm. I added the the emphasis, or uh, sorry, the, the degree in literary translation. And I, did, I don't know why I did that. Mm -hmm. I just felt this incredible urge that this is going to be important to me. I don't know why. And even if initially the, the message was, if you want to be a great poet, then translate. What we find out later in this humorous way is, I actually found those letters right after I finished my translation work. Mm. And it seemed to match with the timing that, well, maybe to be a great poet actually means I need to translate my mother's letters and I need to read them again. I have to speak in her voice and I have to, to understand how that feels and sounds like. Mm. And so it, it's a, it's a, it's a magical thing that happened and I still keep in touch with this poet and I sent him a letter not too long ago telling him about that line mm. and he wrote back to me. He wrote back that he said, I didn't do anything. He said that he, he said, I, I didn't do anything. It was you, you were just ready you were open and you were ready. And so whatever was said was heard. And that, I mean, I think there's something there too. It's, it's, just, it's just to be ready, just to be open. And what surprise might come your way to, if you hear something and you have a response to it, uh, how that little thing can um, change the course of your life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that's beautiful. Um, we've been talking so much about your mother and your grandmothers, but you do have a father <laughs> and with him, you have a <laughs> relationship too. So I thought it would be really interesting to hear from you. Um, the poem you wrote about your father and that's how we're gonna end today. So would you mind reading the poem and tell us a little bit about the poem you wrote about your father? Yes, yes, thank you. Uh, this has been a wonderful interview, but more than that, it's just been a place to, to catch up and to talk a little bit about everything. So yeah. thank you. Uh, it's fitting that it's Korean American Day. I'm yeah. going to Absolutely. read a poem from my poetry collection, A Lesser Love, mm -hmm. and the, this poem inspired the beginning of the memoir. And so you'll hear almost exactly the same lines that begin the memoir. And this poem is actually about my father. It's called Father in His Old Age. There is a Korean belief that you are born the parent of the one you hurt most. Watching my father use chopsticks to split chicken katsu, he confesses that I may be the reincarnation of his own father. We finish our waters in silence and walk home chatting about who to blame for where we are. Thank you so much, EJ. Um, I think that's all we have for now. So congratulations again, and we wish you all the best and stay healthy. 
You can purchase The Magical Language of Others wherever books are sold. You can find more information about it on our website, koreasociety.org. Special thanks to Peter, our IT I'll director. I'll never meet him again. Special <laughs> thanks to Peter, our IT director. Thank you, you cut out a little bit, so I started talking. So I just want to say thank you, EJ. This was just so wonderful and we wish, wish you all the best. Um, and especially, I hope you get your power back really soon. Um, <laughs> As I mentioned, uh, um, The Magical Language of Others, the paperback version will be released next week. Special thanks to Peter, our IT director, for making this live webcast a possibility. And to our interns, Jia and Hiju, for getting all the questions and doing email outreach and social media postings. And of course, our thanks to you, our members and viewers. We hope you'll join us again. Um, Check out what's coming up on our website, koreasociety.org, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Happy reading and, and Happy New Year. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>